Hi, it's Mr. Anderson. Welcome to AP Biology Lab to walk through. This is on enzyme catalysis, so it's basically the enzyme lab. The enzyme that we'll be studying is something called catalase. Catalase is an enzyme that's found in almost all living things, and its job is to break down this chemical. This chemical looks a lot like water, but we've got an extra oxygen, so this is hydrogen peroxide. And so if you ever skinned your knee when you were growing up and your mom put uh, hydrogen peroxide on it, what you found is that it started to bubble. And the reason it was bubbling is that this enzyme is found in almost all living things and it breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen bubbles. And so is it cleaning the wound? Probably not any more than water, but it made me feel good when I was little. Um, the enzyme that we'll be using comes from yeast. So catalase from yeast in this experiment. Basically we should talk about what an enzyme is. An enzyme is going to be a biological molecule that acts as a catalyst. A catalyst is going to be any chemical that speeds up a reaction, but it's not really consumed in the reaction itself. It's not a reactant or a product. Uh, let me give you an example of that. If you uh, can drink milk and, and uh, you don't feel sick, then you have an enzyme that functions called lactase. Lactase is going to break down a disaccharide called lactose. It's, found, it's a sugar that's found in milk. So basically the lactose will fit into the enzyme almost like a key in a lock. It's going to then put a little chemical tug on it and it's going to break that lactose down into its two sugars. And so if you look at the enzyme itself, the lactase, it's never changing its shape. It's just receiving a substrate, we call that, or a molecule that fits into an enzyme. It breaks it apart and then it waits for another one over and over and over again. And for things like lactase, this can happen millions of times a second. So it goes really, really quickly. And so in this experiment, what we're going to use is catalase. So catalase is an enzyme. What's it break down? It essentially breaks down hydrogen peroxide or H2O2. It's going to take that in as a substrate and it's going to break that down into two things. It's going to break that down into H2O and then oxygen or those little oxygen bubbles. And it happens at the rate of millions of times a second. And so in this lab, basically what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of filter paper and then we're going to dip it in different concentrations of yeast. We're going to dip it into a concentration of yeast where there's no yeast, so we would call that zero. And then we're going to increase the concentration of yeast. We'll then take that filter paper and we're going to drop it into a beaker, but that beaker is going to contain hydrogen peroxide. Okay, what happens now? We're going to put that little dropper. It's going to sink down to the bottom. And so if there's no yeast on it, what's going to happen? Well, that filter paper is going to sit at the bottom forever. It will never float because there's no enzyme on it. There's no catalase on it to break that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So it'll sit there forever. But if we add a certain amount of yeast to it, what we're going to find is now when we put it in the hydrogen peroxide, it's going to start breaking down that hydrogen peroxide into water and bubbles. And so bubbles will start to build up on that and eventually it will float to the top. And so what we can do is we can use a stopwatch. We can time how long it takes for that um, piece of paper to float to the top and that's going to tell us the rate of the reaction. And so the more yeast we add, you could imagine, the faster it's going to float up to the top. And so here's the results from one of the students in my class. So basically we increase the concentration, this is the amount of that enzyme in grams per liter, and then we measured it in floats per second. This is kind of a weird unit. Why do we measure it in floats per second? Well it's a rate and so it has to be over a certain amount of time. And so basically we're timing the float, how long it takes for one of them to float, we divide it by the seconds that it takes and that gives us a rate. And so again, if, it, if we put it in there with no yeast, what's going to be the rate? Well, it will never ever float. So if we take one float divided by infinite time, that's going to have a rate of zero. But you can see on here that basically what we're going to get a, is a curve that looks something like that. And so if I were to extrapolate a little bit, it's going to eventually go all the way out like that. Now you might think to yourself, well, we're increasing the amount of yeast. Why doesn't it keep going linear like that? Well, the reason why is that even though we've increased the number of enzymes, we've broke down so much of that hydrogen peroxide that it doesn't matter anymore. So this would be the curve results that we would expect. And so basically what we're doing again to review is that we're breaking down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. This is the chemical formula uh, that you need to know. We're measuring that rate, and we could measure that rate by looking at the number of products. That's what we're doing in this case. We're measuring the amount of oxygen that's produced, or we could measure a decrease in the amount of hydrogen peroxide. But in this lab, we only measured one thing. We measured an increase in the amount of enzyme. And when you're taking the AP Biotest, they could ask you questions about other things. And so what if we increase the substrate? What's that going to do? Well, if we increase the substrate, it's going to be more of it to break down, so it's going to increase right away. 
Uh, what about pH or what about temperature? Well, let's think about temperature for a second. Let's say we were to take an enzyme, some enzyme that's found inside us, let's say lactase, and we were to measure it at different temperatures. What would happen? Well, we'd find a curve that looks something like this. In other words, it's going to increase to a point like that, and then it's going to decrease. So temperature is an interesting one. We should think about that for a second. Why is it increasing on this side of this optimal level? Well, that's because the substrates are moving around. They're moving around, so molecular uh, motion, and the, the higher the temperature is, the faster they're going to move around. So they're more likely to run into an enzyme. Why does it eventually drop off on this side? That's because eventually that enzyme, since it's a protein, is going to denature. It's going to break apart. Now the substrate doesn't fit into it, so it doesn't work. And so in humans, that's going to be around 37 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature inside our body. So they're designed to work at that optimal temperature. If we were to look at bacteria that are growing in a hot pot in Yellowstone Park, we'd find that their curve is going to be way out here. In other words, they're going to have an optimum much closer to boiling. Um, in other words, they've evolved to that specific temperature. If we were to look at pH then, what would pH do? pH is going to be very similar to a curve that looks like this. If we were to change the pH from zero, we'll say, up to like, um, I don't know, 14, it's going to curve like that as well. And then it's going to peak out at a specific pH. And it's going to be an optimum, optimum pH. Now it's not molecular motion on either side, and so it might look a little bit more like that. It's going to be denaturing of the protein, either in an acidic environment or a basic environment. And so now you know a little bit about enzymes, how we set that up, how we do that lab, and so I hope that's helpful.